jump into uh, the, the sermon today, the new series. And if you have your Bibles, I want you to go to the book of Acts with me. We're going to be in Acts chapter 1. So today starts our fall series, and it's called the book of Acts. I'm not 100% sure where we will all go in the book of Acts, if we will just highlight certain things or if we will go uh, chapter by chapter. Uh, that's still up for debate uh, with the Holy Spirit, so I'm following his lead and his guide. Um, for sure, the next two weekends, today and next weekend, uh, we will cover chapter 1 and chapter 2. Uh, we're, again, following the Holy Spirit and his guidance and what he would want us to accomplish with this series. What does Acts mean? We will get to um, our, our text in just a moment. Before we get to our text, and if you're watching by YouTube, hang on with us, okay? And, and all of those in the room, because I'm about to lay a foundation. Uh, one of the concerns I have as a pastor is the lack of biblical engagement among Christians today. And I want to make sure the church I pastor has a good foundation, a solid foundation. And I think to do that, I, I need to teach you. Uh, the, the Bible talks about my people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. And so to me, knowledge is power. And so I want to give you as much knowledge and foundational things as I can. So try to stay with me and don't get bored. Uh, don't nod off to sleep. <laughs> okay. I'm going to lay some foundation, and if you will be patient with me and let me lay the foundation, we'll read our text, and then I think the Lord wants to minister something very special to you after that, okay? And so if the Lord continues to lead me like he has all morning, I'm probably going to give one of the most unusual altar calls I've ever given on a, on a subject that I've, I don't think I've ever given an altar call for. So stay with us. And be patient, and let's lay some foundation. What does Acts mean? Well, Acts, um, it's, it's not an axe like you cut a tree down with. It's not that kind of axe. It is short for Acts of the Apostles. Acts of the Apostles. Another way to say this is the action of the Apostles. Why do we do series at One Community Church? The main reason is because there is an accumulative effect when it comes to knowledge it's like putting one stone on top of another. So it helps us not scatter shoot or cherry pick, but build sermons and subjects one on top of the other. Acts is action. If you like definitions, write this down. Acts is action. It's movement. It's the performance of. Let me say that again. It's action, movement, and performance of. This was the action the apostles took to birth the early church and to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ all over the world, and not just to the Jews, but also to us Gentiles. Are you proud of that? What does apostle mean? Write this down. A vigorous pioneering of a particular policy, idea, or cause. Let me say that again for my note takers. A vigorous pioneering of a particular policy, idea, or cause. In Greek, it means a messenger or delegate. A messenger or delegate. The book of Acts is a documentary, so it's a document of, deleg of a delegation of leaders that God chose to establish the early church. The book of Acts mentions all of the apostles we just talked about in our summer series called the Big Twelve. It primarily focuses on the works of Peter and Paul, but mostly the Apostle Paul. Now, something to think about. Paul wrote 13 New Testament books or letters to the churches that he helped establish. They are called the Pauline epistles. So if you ever hear that terminology, you will know what that means. They are called, the letters that Paul wrote to the churches are called the Pauline epistles. Most of these um, epistles fit in the book of Acts. The book of Acts gives us insight into the three-plus journeys of Paul's ministry. Who wrote the book of Acts? Acts was written by Luke. So this is kind of like Luke part two or Luke season two. <laughs> 
Acts is a bridge between the life and times of Jesus and the early church. It starts in Jerusalem, but it ends in Rome with Paul sitting in prison for two years. The book of Luke and Acts fit together in style and theme. Now we know Luke was not one of the twelve. Real quick, who is Luke? Colossians 4 gives us some insight on who Luke is. He was a Gentile, so he's the only writer of a New Testament book that was not a Jew. Luke was from Antioch. He was a physician or a doctor. He was regarded as a man of culture and had a scientific mind, meaning most of of Luke's writings lean towards the forensic evidence of who Jesus was. He was a master in Hebrew and classical Greek. Luke was a leader in the church of Philippi for more than six years before he rejoins Paul in Acts chapter 16 and was with Paul right up until the very end. If you study history, the relationship between Luke and Paul is incredible. The bond that these two men had was really out of this world. It was supernatural, the bond that the two men had. Uh, I never will forget, many years ago I did a funeral. And in that funeral, the Holy Spirit led me to preach on the relationship between Luke and Paul because it was... um, it was significant to the person's funeral that I was preaching to because there was a bond between that person and another person. And, and I remember studying the history of, of the relationship between Luke and Paul, and it touched my life. Aren't you thankful for God-given relationships that God puts you in contact with certain people and there is a bond that is built between you? And that's what happens in church. In church, there's bonds that are formed, and they could start literally in a two-minute countdown when you greet somebody and you meet them for the first time. You could be meeting a person that will be in your life for the rest of your life. And so there was a significant bond between Luke and the Apostle Paul. Acts starts with the 40 days Jesus appeared and walked the earth after his resurrection. He appeared to his disciples more than 10 times. He ate with them, and he fellowshiped with them, and he proved that he was alive. It starts there, but it ends 28 chapters later with Paul sitting in a prison in Rome. The book of Acts was written for us. This is important, and you ought to write it down. The book of Acts was written for us, but it wasn't written to us. The book of Acts was written for us, but it wasn't written to us, and there's a difference. Many of the Pauline epistles were written to Christians, but Acts was written to a man named Theophilus as an account to the Jewish system in Rome in defense of Paul's life and his ministry. So you could say that Luke is acting as a defense attorney for Paul. That's what's happening in the book of Acts. He is defending his friend Paul. In the book of Acts, it it begins with the pronoun I in first person because the early church knew who the author was. Paul always ended his books with signing his name, so we know Paul is not the I in the book of Acts. He also refers to the pronouns we, us, they, and them, meaning others were present for many of these acts. So what Luke is saying to Theophilus is, Paul and I are not the only ones that witnessed what is happening here that I'm writing to you, but there were others that witnessed everything I'm about to describe. So it's not just us. The book of um, Acts has a powerful anointing for revelation. In the first two chapters alone, which is where we will spend today and next weekend, this is where we get all of the main doctrine for the church 2,000 years later that we're still operating under now, okay? Next weekend, I will go more into doctrine, and we're going to go into Acts chapter 2, and we're specifically going to talk about the infilling of the Holy Spirit, okay? I'm going to lay some doctrine, and in this message, I am not going to pick on uh, any denominations, but I have to call some denominations out so you can have an understanding of who I'm talking about, and you can get some doctrinal truths and how different denominations believe certain things, okay? And then I'm also going to show you what we believe here at One Community Church. 
And it's going to be a powerful time. And I'm just believing God next weekend, many people are going to be filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's what we're believing for. The early church was conceived when Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but it did not take its first breath until Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost. Penta means five. Everybody say five. Meaning 50 days after Passover, Acts chapter 2 happened, which was after Jesus died, was buried, and resurrected. So 50 days later was a feast called Pentecost, one of the Jewish feasts. That was the day the Lord poured His Spirit out, and we're going to learn all about that next weekend. Penta means five. So it's 50 days after Passover is a feast called Pentecost, or what we would call in America Easter. So 50 days from then is when the Holy Spirit was poured out in Acts chapter 2. For much of this writing of Acts, when it was written, Paul was in prison. It doesn't end with his death, but when he was charged. He was indicted, but he had not been put to death in Rome. In Acts 1, Luke is given Theophilus the origin of the power that Paul operates in. He is making a case in Paul's defense. It was to give a credibility to Paul as he sat waiting for his fate in prison. So let's go to Acts chapter 1, and we're going to start reading in verse 1 and the verses following. If you're there, say amen. I believe today I'm reading from the New International Version. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles that he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. Everybody shout out, wait. Wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John, talking about John the Baptist, baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Everybody say, with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive what? You will receive power when what happens? When the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and Samaria to the ends of the earth. Verse 9. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus, everybody say same Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Can I hear a praise God? Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from a hill called the Mount of Olives. By the way, when Jesus comes back in the second return of Jesus, when he comes back to this earth, he will also come back to the same place he left, which is the Mount of Olives. So the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. By the way, this is the same room where they had communion, and they took the Lord's Supper. Those present were Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon, the zealot, and Judas, son of James. So all the guys we just studied in the summer series. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Aren't you glad that Mary was in the room when the Holy Spirit fell? (laughs) In those days, didn't forget mom. (laughs) Mom got the gift. In those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120, and said, Brothers and sisters, the scripture has been fulfilled in which the Holy Spirit spoke long ago through David concerning Judas, who served as a guide for those who arrested Jesus. He was one of the number and shared in our ministry. 
With the payment he received, talking about Judas Iscariot, with the payment he received for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong, his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called the field in their language, Akadama, that is the field of blood. For said Peter, it is written in the book of Psalms, may his place be deserted, let there be no one to dwell in it. And may another take his place of leadership. Verse 21, therefore it is necessary to choose one of the men who have been with us the whole time the Lord Jesus was living among us beginning from John's baptism to the time when Jesus was taken up from us. For one of these must become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they nominated two men, Joseph called Barsabas, also known as Justice, and Matthias. Then they prayed, Lord, you know everyone's heart. Show us which of these two you have chosen to take over the apostolic ministry which Judas left to go where he belongs." Then they cast lots, and the lot fell to Matthias, so he was added to the eleven apostles. We just read the first chapter of the book of Acts, and a lot of loose ends were tied up from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Did y'all see that? To me, the book of Acts shows us we don't just go into all the world and preach the gospel, but we grow into all the world and we preach the gospel. Amen? Because... There was a qualification process for these men before they went out to all the world. So there has to be qualification before there's multiplication. Is that right? There was a process. In other words, don't just be a follower only. Don't just be a dead end and do a bunch of stuff, but you don't grow into your calling. Everybody say grow into your calling. We cannot just receive, 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 and never give, give, give. There has to be a balance of both of those in our lives. A lot of the reasons why churches don't grow is churches don't teach on the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Here's the thing. We are not saved, set free, delivered, and healed just to enjoy our life. I am those things so I can go out by the power of the Holy Spirit and help other people get saved, set free, and delivered and healed. Jesus' words in chapter 1, don't leave Jerusalem until you be endued with power. And he uses a word that is so poignant. He says, wait. Everybody shout out, wait. Come on, say it again, wait. Now this was hard for the disciples. And this is hard for us. We don't like waiting, but there is a lot of things that happen in a waiting room, and sometimes it requires waiting. The disciples were not fond of Jerusalem. Why? Jerusalem was a place of pain for them. It was a place of shame for them. If you'll remember, this Jesus had just been, uh, you know, crucified, was buried, and then, of course, resurrected. But this was a place of shame for them because when they arrested Jesus, the disciples scattered. They were cowards. And so this was a place of shame. Not only that, but because they could be recognized that everyone knew they traveled with Jesus, they could also be killed. Write this down. Restoration always requires a return. Restoration always requires a return. We don't want to go back to the place of pain and suffering and confront things. But I want to tell you today, as one who loves you, you have to go back and you have to confront things. What did we say the last few weekends? What you don't confront, you will never conquer. Come on, let's say that again. Let me, everybody say it with pastor. What we don't confront, we will never conquer. Jesus said, don't rush into the apostolic ministry without being fully equipped to do what I've called you to do. Here's here's something good you ought to write down. What we think we need to accomplish God's plan for us is not what God needs. What we think we need to accomplish God's plan for us is not necessarily what God needs. To me, those are two very different things. We want to go, and God says, wait. We want to go, and God says, wait. Someone um, asked me, you know, what is, this was not too long ago, they asked me, what is one of the biggest challenges that you have as a pastor? And I would say top five, one of the biggest challenges I have is getting people to wait. 
to wait. We're saved, we get excited, we want to do things for God, but there is a qualification before there's multiplication. And so to me, one of the hardest things that I've dealt with, especially in the last five years since we've come, come under the name of one community, is you're going to learn this about pastor, is I, I am a guy that waits on the Holy Spirit. That is our leadership style. We're very organic. That's the culture that we want to build at one community. Not organizational, but organic. Meaning we flow in the Holy Spirit. We leave space for the Holy Spirit to do what he wants to do. I tell my staff all the time, we're not going to just throw a bunch of stuff at the wall and hope something sticks. No, we're going to be very poignant with what we throw onto the wall. We're going to wait till the Holy Spirit breathes breathes upon it because when he breathes upon it, it will work. Amen? But if we try to do it in ourselves, it won't work. Amen? So we're going to wait. To steward well, sometimes it requires waiting. Everybody say waiting. Their question exposed their internal struggle. Their question was, what's the plan? And Jesus said, here's what I want you to do. Stay, don't leave until you receive. That's the instruction. But their following question was, just like Christians, (laughs) is this the time you're going to do all the things that I want you to do? And Jesus says in the NIV, it's not for you to know. The Jason Yarbrough, South Arkansas commentary for that is none of your business. And listen, we're laughing and we should laugh. And I said that to make you laugh. But I also said that because there's a lot of truth in that. If you're not okay with some things being none of your business, this Christian thing's going to be hard for you. There are some things that God is not going to reveal to you. There's some things He's not going to tell you too far in advance. And there has to be a waiting process where you're waiting and you're patient with the Lord to do what He wants to do. Jesus is like, you're asking the wrong questions. You think a plan is what you need, and what you need is a counselor. You need the Holy Spirit. How many of you know that's what He's referred to in John? He is a counselor. He is the chief counselor. Amen. Jesus is like, I know what you need, not you. And I need you to listen and obey. Well, why? Why? (laughs) Do you know why? Let me give you a why. Do you know why the Holy Spirit came? Because the waiting came. Do you know why the Holy Spirit came? Because the obedience came. Do you know why the Holy Spirit came? Because the surrender came. There, there is, where, where there's unity, God commands a place of blessing. In other words, there's unity in the place of surrender. I need you to throw out your church growth plans and who I'm going to use and how I'm going to use them, and I need you to wait for the person of the Holy Spirit. They're asking for a plan, and Jesus says, you don't need a plan, you need power. You think you need a plan, but what you need is power. And power doesn't come from what you know. And let me just say this. I love intellectual and teaching, and, and, and you can see that in, in my sermons. I love history, and, and I love knowledge, and I've talked about that in the onslaught of this message today about knowledge, and knowledge is good, and there's a place for that. But you're going to really struggle if you rely on your intellect to understand the Holy Spirit. Because you do not understand the Holy Spirit here. You understand Him right here. And if you're always trying to logically, intellectually figure him out, you're going to struggle. But there is an opening of your spirit where you open your spirit and you receive by faith. Amen. Power doesn't come from what you know. If that were true and it was based on what we know, then God would have only had one tree in the Garden of Eden. When Adam and Eve ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they thought it would be empowering, but it was actually disempowering. Supernatural power does not come from what you gain. Listen to me, this may be the most important thing I say all day. Supernatural power does not come from what you gain. It comes from what you give up. Supernatural power does not come from what you gain. It comes from what you give up. 
And I've said this before, but it's the only thing that comes to my mind. You see me up here anointed, and you feel the, atten- the, the tangible anointing of the Holy Spirit. You see what's going on here at One Community Church. I said this last weekend, but I'll say it again. It needs to be repeated. We're not just a church that believes in miracles. We are a miracle. And so you see all that God is doing here. It is unbelievable what God has done at One Community Church. It is is amazing. What has happened here, and that's why religious folk don't understand it. Because what's happening here is not natural, it's supernatural. What you see, what you you feel, what's tangible, the goosebumps, all of those things, that is the working of the Holy Spirit. That is the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Can I hear an amen? Amen. But this anointing has come because of what we have given up to stand here. I am anointed. In fact, the more anointed I am, the more of me I give up. The more of me I surrender. The more of me that I say in obedience, God, what would you like for me to do? God, you told me to do something. I'm going to keep doing that until you tell me to do something else. Amen. It comes from what you give up. The power in Acts 2.38 came from, the, to, came from the returning of the place of their pain and waiting until God made sense of what they had been through. We do the same thing. Can I tell you today, we worry about the wrong things. We worry about the wrong things. When we pray, we tend to pray for the struggle to end, not to be strengthened to overcome in the struggle. Well, I want a formula, Pastor. I want a book. I want three points that explain to me every detail of what I need to do. And I just have to say it again, and I may say it a few more times. You're going to struggle with this Christian thing if you always want a plan and a formula. You're going to struggle. If you're following the Holy Spirit, He will tell you when you need to know. Amen. Well, we want leadership. We want, we want a book on leadership. Listen, God's plan is to strengthen you and to empower you. And how many of you know, you don't build muscle sitting at home on your couch. You cannot build muscle having church at home. Building muscle requires pressing against something. Acts is action. There has to be an action. Christians don't do well idle. We are not supposed to be on the defensive all the time. We're supposed to be on the offensive. In other words, Christians are supposed to be out activating their faith, acting under the power of the Holy Spirit. We're supposed to be witnessing to people. We're supposed to be serving. We're supposed to be encouraging. We're supposed to be ministering. We're supposed to be teaching. What is that? That is activation. That is offensive. That is putting your foot on the devil's neck and and being on the offensive instead of the defensive. And what I have learned as a pastor is when you start doing this, some of this petty stuff that you deal with goes away. Some of the struggle that you have, if you would get on the offensive and you would start acting and having action behind who you say you are, a lot of the depression and discouragement and the struggles that you have would immediately go away. Why? Because you're fulfilling your God's given purpose. You're doing what God's called you to do. God called us to be people of action. That's why it's called the book of Acts. Action. Everybody say Acts. Action. You cannot build muscle sitting at home. You cannot build spiritual muscle sitting idle. It is called the book of Acts, again, because it's action. This is not about your plan. This is about you being in the right place at the right time, doing the right things in obedience and in surrender and in unity, so when the Holy Spirit shows up, you will be ready. Why? Why does he not tell you beforehand? Because you wouldn't accept it and you wouldn't believe it if he told you before. What I have learned with people, pastoring people, if I tell you too much in advance, you will overthink it. You will overthink it. You will overanalyze it. You will put your spin on it. You will intellectually process it. That's why in our services, Pastor D will say the loudest amen. I drive him and Barbie crazy and my wife. Because they want details. They want a plan. And you know what a pastor's teaching them? I'm teaching them how to wait. So 
I don't even like, like we have planning center. I don't go on there, just to be honest with you. I follow the Holy Spirit. Now, listen, you need to get on there, so they're going to crucify me for that statement. But, but here's what I meant by that. I'm talking about now the planning center is great for the teams, so I'm backtracking. Y'all notice that? But watch this. When it comes to the order of the service, this is what I was talking about. When it comes to the order of the service, we always allow space for the Holy Spirit to do something unexpected. So when they ask me, what altar song are we doing? My answer every time is, I don't know. And you know why I don't know? Because I want the Holy Spirit to orchestrate this in a service. I want to be spontaneous with what the Holy Spirit wants to do. I don't want to be so rigid that we figure out every moment of time of a service and what we're going to do at this time and this time and this time. No, we want the Holy Spirit to show up and we want Him to do whatever it is He wants to do. Amen. So ignore what I said about planning center. You need that for your team so you'll know what in the world to do, okay? But we're talking about the order of service. So you won't believe it if he shares it with you too far in advance. Ten days of waiting. Everybody say ten days. What did they do during this ten days? What all church folks do. They got churchy and they had a vote. Y'all don't want to get me on this. You see, that's one of the reasons why one community, the structure of one community is set up the way it is, and it's different than what you see in the South in most typical Southern churches. And so if you come from the South, which all of you do, and you've been in church in the South, then you know the government and how a church is orchestrated, and this church is not one of them. Okay? Okay? My dad used to say it this way, if you want to vote, go to the courthouse. Okay? We got one vote. His name is the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we're led by the Holy Spirit. So they decided to have a vote. We need 12. Remember, they lost Judas. That is their filter, not God's filter. They chose Matthias. He was their choice, but he was not God's choice. And this is what churches do. This is why churches all over the South are failing. This is why churches are closing their doors in the South, in the Bible Belt. Churches are empty and becoming vape shops and and whatever kind of shops. God forbid. It is because they're not following and waiting for the leading of the Holy Spirit. They're trying to be churchy and they're trying to do it in themselves. Amen. So people come up with a choice, and people come up with a plan, but it's not God's plan, and it's not God's choice. You never hear of Matthias again. Their focus was on the wrong things. They were trying to be intellectual. They were trying to, have a, to, to do it with their human mind and their human understanding. Write this down. You're never just waiting You are never just waiting. This wasn't about governance. It was about unity. This wasn't about governance. It was about unity. In other words, this wasn't about a leadership problem. This was not a leadership problem. And I love the leadership gurus of the world. There's some great ones out there, and I've read their books, but I don't always agree with them. Why? Because I've read this book called the Bible, and sometimes it's not a leadership problem. Sometimes it's a sin problem. Sometimes it's a squirrely people problem. Amen. Sometimes it's a flaky people problem. Flaky Christians. It was a unity problem, and the only thing that will bring unity is not a new hire on staff. It's not a pastor. It's not a new building. It's not a family life center. It's waiting for the person of the Holy Spirit to show up and do what only He can do. Amen. And and that's why churches do not figure this out. They can't figure this out. I hope some of them are watching today. Because you're trying to do it in your human mind. And this is a power thing. It's not a plan thing. It's a power thing. It's the Holy Spirit revealing His power, showing us organically what He wants to do. Can I hear an amen? Man, I feel the Lord in here. 
Thank you, Lord. Can we just praise him right now? Father, I praise you. Come on, all over this room. Lord, we praise you right now. We praise you, Lord. Lord, we're ready to receive. Lord, we're ready to receive what you have for us. Everybody say amen to that. What we do is not human or natural. It's supernatural. The Bible says, unless God builds a house, your labor is in vain. The Bible also says, it's not by might, it's not by power, by your own power, but it's by His Spirit, saith the Lord. When it's the Holy Spirit, everything just happens. So, yes, there's work to it, but, but when the Holy Spirit breathes on it, it just ignites, that flame ignites, and it just starts happening. It's almost like you're, you can stand back. It's like right now, I could literally stand back. It feels that way and watch myself preach. Why? Because this is not natural, Jason. This is the supernatural operating through Jason. And so when the Holy Spirit does that, what I see with a lot of church folk is that they don't want to wait for the Holy Spirit to say now. They want to go ahead and go now. My dad used to say it this way, some were sent and some just went. In other words, this, this is one of my struggles, is I feel like sometimes people are running the ball down the field and I never handed the ball to them to begin with. We never called the play. And they're running down the field. Do y'all see what I'm saying? You have to wait for the Holy Spirit to orchestrate that and say, now do it. Amen. And here's, here's the problem. Because when we do a bunch of stuff, it's going to make us tired and depleted. And we're going to be worn out and burnt out just doing a bunch of churchy things. Okay? And I've seen this happen over and over. We want to go, 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 go. We want to do, do, do. And then we go, go, go. And we do, do, do. And then we're tired. And we feel like doo-doo. <laughs> that just came to my mind. Are y'all following me? And then, guess what happens? The Holy Spirit ignites something, and He says, now do it, and everybody's tired and worn out. Because we did not wait for the Holy Spirit to tell us now, and we didn't wait for Him to give us instructions. Praise God. It was their focus. Everybody say, focus, obedience, surrender, that brought unity. Write this down. God doesn't override your free will or your faith level. It's when everyone is on the same page of surrender to whatever God wants to do. If you will wait, it'll be so much better than what you fear you've lost. If you will wait, it will be so much better than what you fear you have lost. They chose Matthias, but God chose Saul, who would later become Paul. In other words, Paul did not fit into their churchy box. Paul did not fit into their human brain. God was like, I'm doing something so much bigger than your tiny Galilean country perspective. God's purpose, you've got to get a hold of this, God's purpose is so much bigger than you are. You think you need something, and what we need is the Holy Spirit. Acts was God's multiplication of the church of Jesus Christ in the earth. But the focus of those in that room was addition, not multiplication. We have to add one more, and God wanted to add thousands and blow their minds. God has another plan than just adding one thing at a time. This same thing happens with tithing. Well, I'll try tithing one day. Or I tried tithing and nothing happened. Well, there's a lot of things that we could say about that. One thing is you had not tithed in 30 years, so there is a process to this. Amen. Write this down. Addition and multiplication look the same in the beginning. Addition and multiplication look the same in the beginning. Let me give you an example. Two plus two equals... Two times two equals... But the further you go, something happens to the numbers. Man, I felt Holy Ghost goosebumps just go all over me when I said that. The further you go with the numbers, something starts happening to the numbers, and you go from addition to multiplication. How many of you want multiplication and not addition? See, God does the multiplying. 
But the further you go, something happens. Here's what we do in church. We strive to add instead of waiting and trusting God to multiply. Let me say that again. We strive to add instead of waiting and trusting God to multiply. We are called to wait and surrender in unity. If you want power, then you surrender. Everybody say surrender. Oh no, pastor, I want details. I want a plan. Listen to me. I'm going to say it again for the third time or fourth time. If you want a plan, you're going to struggle with this whole Christian thing because this whole Christian thing is about faith and it's about trust. And we either have faith or we don't have faith. We either trust God or we don't trust God. And at some point, our actions and what we say out of our mouth have to line up. And Christians sometimes say one thing, but we do something else. Both of those two things have to add up. So I either believe God's Word or I don't believe God's Word. And we've got to draw a line in the sand and say, I either believe this deal or I don't believe this deal. But if you believe this deal, then let your mouth and your actions line up. I've got to stop. Somebody say amen. I want the worship team. Come on, we're we're following the Holy Spirit. I want all the worship team to come to the platform. Larry, I want you to cue up that last song they just did, and we're going to sing that here in just a moment. That last song. What's the name of that holy ground? We're going to do that last song. I'm not done preaching yet. Hold on just a minute. God doesn't override our plan, but He's waiting for us to follow His plan. Write this down. God won't give you power to accomplish your plan, only His plan. God won't give you power to accomplish your plan, only His plan. The greatest test to see if you're surrendered to God's plan is your ability to wait. Everybody say wait. Let me ask you today, Pastor D, start playing as soon as possible. Are you going to get impatient and run off because it's not what you want to see or what you want to happen? Or are you going to wait? Everybody say wait. I want to tell you something. What God has prepared for you, time is irrelevant. What God has prepared for you, time is irrelevant. In other words, it's worth the wait. It's worth the wait. It's worth all the waiting. It's worth all the surrendering. Hallelujah. God, we wait. God, we will be a church that waits on you. Our waiting is uncomfortable. Lord, help us be patient in the waiting. The old saints used to say, We tarry. We tarry and we wait for the Holy Spirit to show up. Can I tell you what God has for you is so great? The life that He has for you is so great. And it's worth whatever you have to give up. It's worth whatever you have to leave behind. It's, what, it's worth whatever you have to walk away from. Whatever relationship you have to walk away from. It's worth the wait. It's worth the wait. Well, I don't like being lonely. Wait. Wait. Wait for the Holy Spirit to bring that person to you. Don't get ahead of God. Wait for Him. He has a plan. He has a purpose. Come on, church. I need you. I need you praying right now. Come on. Everybody praying. Don't don't stand yet, but come on. Let's just lift our hands and praise Him right there. Come on. Praise Him right there. Father, we're, we're waiting. God, we're trusting You. God, we're believing You. God, we want multiplication. We don't want addition. We want multiplication. God, in this church of one community, we want multiplication. Hallelujah. (laughs) God, we praise you. God, we worship you. God's saying today, stop being preoccupied with a plan. And God say, I need your spirit. Quit being preoccupied with a plan and say, God, I need your spirit. I need your spirit to wreck my marriage. I need your spirit to wreck my family. God, we need you. We need your power. We need your power. How do we get his power? Surrender, obedience, unity. Surrender, obedience, unity. Surrender, obedience, unity. Father, we'll wait. We need your spirit. Real power doesn't come without surrender. 
Real power doesn't come without surrender. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, we praise you. Oh, Father, we praise you. Lord, I'm going to ask you right now to multiply. Holy Spirit, multiply in this room. I want you to stand if you would. Come on, stand. I've never given an altar call for this subject. To my knowledge, this is the first time. I don't remember. 22 years of pastoring is a long time. I don't think I've ever given an altar call for this subject, but I'm about to. But if you're here with heads bowed and eyes closed and nobody looking around, and you've gotten impatient, and you've, you've declared go when God says wait, you declared go when God said wait, and today you want to come to this altar and you want to say, God, the wait is worth it. And God, I'm willing to wait and I'm willing to trust you. And I'm willing to wait for the Holy Spirit to do what only the Holy Spirit can do. I'm not going to get ahead of you. I'm not going to be impatient. But the wait will be worth it. And if you're here and you just want to come and you want to say, God, I'll come stand here in the wait. And God, I won't get uncomfortable in the wait. I want you to step out from where you are and come join us at the front of this building. Come just stand here and we're going to worship and we're going to pray together. But I want you to say, God, the wait is worth it. God, the wait is worth it. I want you to come here and say, God, I'm sorry for being impatient. I'm sorry for getting ahead of you. God, I'm willing to wait. I will wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. I will wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit. They're coming, they're coming, they're coming. Should it be you? Should you be stepping out of your seat? Should it be you on your two legs walking up here saying, God, I will wait. God, I will trust you. God, I will have faith. I will not get uncomfortable in the waiting. Come on, is that you? God is moving. There, there is an anointing on this, on this message. There is an anointing for waiting on this message today. Father, I'm willing to wait. I'm willing to trust you to do what only you can do. Come on, I think there's others that are supposed to be standing here. Hey, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. 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 So what I want to do is you're coming up here and stand. Part of the waiting is not being uncomfortable waiting for pastor to lead you in a prayer. So what I want you to do is you're standing here. I want surrender to start happening. I want obedience to start happening. These ladies are fixing to lead us, and as they lead us in song, I want you to stand here and go, God, I will wait in obedience and surrender, and there's things in my life I need to be surrendering to you right now. Come on, those in the front, those standing in the congregation, we'll dismiss you in a few moments, but the wait is worth it. Come on.